Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta and to our Mystery Monday, we, which we haven't really done in a hot second because we're doing the Emerald Tablets right now. And as you guys know, we're still working on that fifth tablet over on Aquarius Rising Africa. We've already done the fifth tablet here on my channel. So I am taking this awesome opportunity to give other people a chance to come on and present mystery. Everybody loves a good mystery. Like we all, hello, like there's a reason why like Murder, She Wrote was a very famous television series. Like we all love a good mystery. And so I'm joined here with my friend Tracy Woodman. And what's so exciting, you guys know Tracy, she's been on the channel lots now, but she actually, you guys, she just opened up her own, her very own YouTube channel, which I'm so, so, so excited about under her, would you say this is your nom de plume? Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is I write under the, the name Lee Woods. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so she's writing uh, he's putting it under Lee Woods. We've I'm gonna put all the links down in the description box below. Tra uh, tra I was about to call you Lee. I'm looking at Lee. <laughs> <laughs> That's my middle name, so you can. I, that's my dad's name, too. So I'm like, I was like, Trey Lee, Trey Lee, there you go. That's like a southern name, Trey Lee. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, Tracy's also doing the ASEA journey, you guys. We were just talking about that before we started filming, which I know I'm going to put all that down in the description box so that you guys can see um, Tracy's journey through ASEA. And if you want to purchase through Tracy, you can. And, um, yeah, I mean, quickly for like a couple minutes before we get into the story, Tracy, you were saying like people are actually noticing things about you changing in your physical mm -hmm. makeup from the ASEA, you think, correct? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I've just, I've had a few people just, you know, say they notice changes. Um, some have said, I, they think I've lost weight. Um, but again, like I was saying to you, I don't own a scale, so I don't, um, I can't confirm that, but I do feel better. I feel I have more energy. I think my body feels more, um, I don't even know how I want to put it. Uh, maybe younger. I, I feel like my muscles are more toned. Um, and again, I've been doing the doing yoga for a while. So there's that. But in addition to that, I feel different in that sense. So but yeah, my skin looks a little different. Um, it's, you know, it feels better. Um, just, just some little things that I notice about myself too. But yeah, others have said, what are you doing? <laughs> so so that's my that's cells, good. You're like, Maybe I can be a good crazy. advertisement for myself. Yeah. <laughs> my cells are communicating. It's so funny. Yeah. I was laughing with my boyfriend this morning because fortunately I don't have really an issue with cellulite, which a lot of women do. That's very normal. And I think it's just because I've exercised for a majority of my adult life. That's not a super big problem for me. But when I was doing the video with Dr. Silverman, which if you guys missed that, I'll place that down in the description box below. He talked about using the gel on places of your body where you have like cellulite or something. And so I like lathered my legs up this morning. I'm just going to start just doing it because I am 40 now and mm -hmm. I haven't struggled with this in really. So I'm going to try to prevent. I, I don't know. And I just thought, isn't that interesting? Here we are. We've accepted this narrative that this is just what happens. I mean, kids don't have cellulite. Little girls mm -hmm. don't have cellulite. We've just accepted that this is something that happens to us as we age. But what is the aging process? The aging process is literally not having the redox, literally your, your cells not even being able to communicate with each other. And so if you're giving them that boost, then yeah, you are going to start to look younger again and feel younger again and give your body. And that's what I love about it so much as somebody who believes in the power of the body. It's giving your body the support system for your body to be able to heal itself, which really is taking your sovereignty back and taking your power back. So yeah, you guys, I will put all those links down in the description box below. I wanted to just let you guys know that Tracy is very much a part of this now, and I'm so excited. I feel like all my friends are now doing a SIA, which is so exciting. I just love seeing people feel good, feel better. I love seeing other people succeed in that. And if you don't have your help, you don't have anything, do you? So, you know, it's it's that help that really gets us through. But with that being said, I am going to turn the panel over to Tracy because, boy, and it's so hard. I just dig these stories so much that you told me what you were going to present and you already sent the pictures for me to put it in the editing process, but I had to refrain myself from really looking into this too deeply because I wanted to enjoy hearing you tell the story. So I, I <laughs> the story so much. So you guys, with that being said, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it over to Tracy now. Okay, so 
Um, I was actually looking looking into a story that um, that comes out of Hampton, which is a couple of hours from where I live. Um, it's called Memorial Green uh, Memor uh, Meeting House Green Memorial Park um, in Hampton, and it is said that it is haunted by the ghost of Eunice Cole. Eunice Cole is the only woman who they say was convicted of witchcraft in New Hampshire. Um, as I looked into the story, I did not find anything that actually said that she was convicted of witchcraft. So uh, having said that um, and moving forward uh, with the story, I tried to go back a little bit further to see if I could learn a little bit about Eunice prior to her moving to Hampton. So she was actually um, married to William Cold, who was a sawyer. Um, they were married in England. Um, in, uh, in a, medi a medieval Anglican church in St. Dunstan's Parish um, in Stepney, uh, Middlesex, England, uh, which is just outside of London. So uh, it looks like from the records that I've been able to found, I found some conflicting information. So I can't say 100% that every everything is accurate, um, but we're just going to go with what I found. So because the records are sparse, I had to kind of match things up here and there and some things don't match up. I see records where it says that William was 20 to 30 years older than Eunice, which is quite an age difference um, in marriage. So that, that could be a question to ask during this, during this uh, deep dive into who she was. Um, so it would also be interesting to see how young she actually was when she got married. Uh, they were married, oops, sorry. I shut my phone off. Uh, anyway, so um, they were married in the church in England. I'm just going to shut this off so that it doesn't do this again. Um, well, it's interesting you're saying that. Um, what year was this? What? What? So, very good question. Um, she. So it looks like they were married in 1634. So this is going back before, way before, it was going back before the witch trials in um, in England. I mean, in Salem and Boston. So like, that's like the eve of the, because that happened at the end of the 1600s. This is what's interesting, you guys. And I, it's interesting you saying, you're saying her husband was 20 to 30 years older than her, according to some records. I was looking into Joseph Smith and polygamy. And a lot of people, because here he was this like 38, 39 year old man marrying girls who were like 14. And of course, this was the 1800s. So this was a couple of hundred years post this story. But I was listening to this podcast and they were talking about how we excuse that as that was normal back then. But if you look at the statistics, that was not normal back then mm -hmm. to for a 14 year old girl to marry a 38 year old man. They, they pulled up all the statistics that even at that time, the average age for a woman to get married was 22 and the average age for a man was 24. So even in that, that time period, the marriages were close in age, like, like they, most of the time they are now, you know, right. I have the propensity of dating men 10 to 15 years older than me, but I think 20 years is kind of pushing it a little bit. Cause that's just a yeah. different generation at that point. Right now, and I don't know that that's true because I found um, if you if you match up the time frames that are discussed um, and that are verifiable in the town records, I don't see that that was true. So that was my first question when I looked at that um, was was she a tr child bride? Um, was she, yeah, yeah. Which but you know, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So but I did I did actually go back and search the records, the church records, and what I found was. There was a marriage of a William Cole and a uh, Unica. You, it's, it would be Eunice with an A instead of an E. So there's not much difference in the name. So her last name was Giles. Um, same, same, the, the, the St. Dunstan's Stepney London Church. Um, and that was in 1634. Um, that's the, the record that I found. And it, it appears to match up with what was going on at that time and where they came into the country here. So... Um, I was kind of hoping to find some records back further that would show uh, the date of her birth, but I, I didn't have any luck with that. Um, so, but moving forward, um, they, I could just shut this off. I shut this phone off and it's, it turned back on. What's going on here? Um, 
it might be her spirit trying to come on through. That's what I always Maybe. Shut off now. Okay, it's shutting off again. <laughs> Stop. Okay. Um, anyway, so. And the, the, the spelling too, like that, if I, if I for you, you and I are both researchers, I would assume that's the same person because right. even back in those days, people didn't have set, set spellings for their names, you know. Right. Um, well, yeah. well, even in this country uh, with research, um, I found it spelled Eunice with a U, Eunice with an E, and then the spelling with the A at the end, which again, too, I've done a lot of research into uh, genealogy, that type of thing. And you can never be 100% sure because if you're looking at um, records of people coming into the country, ship manifests, they handwrite things you can't read. So you don't know 100% if the name is spelled this way or that way. So um, so anyway, so they married in England. And then the next record I have shows that they were um, indentured servants. They were indentured to a Matthew, Matthew uh, Craddock. Um, and he was actually the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Company. Um, he can you, Steph, uh, yeah. uh, Tracy, can you explain to our audience members who maybe, I know that most American kids know what an indentured servant is. Sure. But can you explain so, to those who are not Americans what that would mean? Sure. So, um, and actually my, my great, 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 I have one in my family back in this early 1600s. So um, what happened was back, back when people started coming into this country, um, uh, a lot of people wanted to leave England for various reasons. A lot of them were religious persecution, but so they wanted to leave the country, but they didn't have any money to do that. So what they would do is they would, um, they would promise to serve uh, another that would pay their passage. So, uh, so in this case, this uh, William Craddock, he paid their passage to this country. And in turn for that, they had a contract that said they would they would work X amount of time for um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony to pay off that passage. Um, so in my case, my my uh, my relative, he worked seven years um, in Portsmouth and then he was actually given land in Maine after he was done. So, so just because you are an indentured servant didn't mean there was, um, you were a slave. Oftentimes that, um, that process entailed you working through the period of time and that person actually handing over land to you so you could begin your new life. So it was not always, it wasn't always a bad thing to be in that position. It was a way to start out in a new world without, um, when you didn't have the money to do so. So that, that, we would call it a live work program today. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, so he, they, they promised, uh, it, the passage was $10 and they promised to work, work that off basically. And, um, they didn't do that. So the couple left his service prematurely and they promised that eventually they would pay the 10 pounds if he released them which they did not do. So to me, that that's the beginning of, okay, apparently William wasn't too on the up and up either. So I'm, I'm, I just have questions about that whole thing. So, um, so needless to say, so they, they moved to New England. Um, they lived in a town village called uh, Mount Wollaston, which is now Braintree. I've also heard it recorded referred to as Quincy. So I'm not sure if they both had that name, if they were both, I, I've seen it referred to as both. Um, Quincy has in the past had a Walston, so, so too has Braintree. So, and that's just south of Boston. Um, so, and back then townships, um, at least in New England, townships would provide land grants to people who wanted to homestead the land who wanted to, to farm the land and, and get ahead. So uh, most people that came into those townships were, were granted X amount of acres to farm and produce and sell and live off of. So the town of Boston, who th knew of the deal that uh, William and Eunice had with Craddock, were only given two acres for their own planting. They weren't given the opportunity to farm the land and and um, and sell. They were only given given what they needed to survive because they 
probably didn't trust them. So they lived in Boston in this area um, from 1637 through part of 1638, which at that time they moved to Exeter or what would become Exeter, New Hampshire. Now, they followed uh, a Reverend John Wheelwright um, to what became Exeter. Uh, Wheelwright was a, a uh, minister who he was actually banned. He was banished from Boston in 1637 for sedition. He had some pretty shady practices um, with his preaching, apparently. So he was he was banished from Boston. Um, so he and um, I think there were 33 other people at the time moved to what became Exeter. He started Exeter. He started a church in Exeter. And among those 33 were William and, and Eunice. Um, just a, on a side note, too, this uh, John Wainwright, he actually was a classmate of um, Oliver Cromwell at Cambridge. So they were friends. So that brings up a little leather red flag for me. Yeah, I've covered all, I've covered that on my channel yeah. before. And that, so mm -hmm. it's so interesting, like like when you're reading this as an American, thinking about our history and these are stories that we're used to hearing. <laughs> But now that we know a little bit more about the other side of the story, you do start to question some of these connections. You do start to question what really is the right side of history. And when you were talking about the uh, the preacher man not being so so glorious, I was like, well, something's never <laughs> something. <laughs> well, and I think I I, I uh, yeah yeah I was thinking that throughout this whole process that this is just another control thing. All yeah. the way back, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. We see you, preachers. We see you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, there's a great Hillsong documentary out right now, you guys. Like, some things just never change in humanity. Right. Today, so. <laughs> that is so true. Uh, so anyway, they, they moved to Exeter, and um, they didn't stay there very long. Um, so in, 16, um, in 1638, so I'm trying to trying to create a timeline too, just to give us an idea of how, what their ages were. And, and I, what I did was I went back from when they died and where they were living to back to try to come up with a better timeline of their ages. So in 1638, William would have been 64 years old. So um, he was a carpenter and he, which he didn't prosper at that. So I'm not sure what the deal was with that. I'm not sure if he was lazy or, or just as he got older, he didn't prosper. I don't know. There's no documentation to indicate why he was not successful. Um, she would have been 48 years old, according to the information, if I go, if I move backward from when she died. So she's 48 at this point. So if they got married in 1634, she was not young when they got married. Back, you know, for, for that, that, time frame anyway so um so anyway so they 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 lived in they lived in boston for about a year they moved to exeter um it was said that she wasn't very likable but there was no not, no trouble with the law or anything so in 1640 they were granted 40 acres of land in um, the town of hampton new hampshire um they didn't move to Hampton until 1644. So they lived in Exeter for a while, what, six years? And nothing, no trouble, no, nothing happened with her. They lived in Boston for a year, no trouble, nothing, nothing came up about, about Eunice. Um, they just lived there somewhat peacefully, I guess. So they weren't in Hampton long before she started getting into trouble before her legal problems began. Um, she was fined. She was set in stocks. She was admonished. She was whipped um, for different infractions of law. In 1645, she, um, she was brought before the court for slanderous speech against her neighbors. So she, she was talking bad about her neighbors or whatever the case was, but um, and then in so six, that 1645, and then in 1647, both Eunice and William were charged with biting the constable um, 
William Fuller was the constable biting his hand, which I don't, that doesn't mean actually biting his hand. It was stealing food from his hand, stealing food from him. So they were both um, charged with, with, with this stealing, this biting of the hand bit. So, um, but you don't hear anything about William getting into trouble or causing trouble beyond that, that you don't see anything in, in writing anywhere. So, Next, Eunice appears in court in 1648, 1651, and 1654, and they don't state what the charges are. They don't state why she was, why, why she had to appear in court. I couldn't find that information. Um, and throughout the, the whole time that she was in Hampton, um, which would be from 16, well, 1656 to, through 1680 is when the trouble began. Uh, she was charged for witchcraft um, three times. So that's 24 years she was tried three times. Um, according to the records, she wasn't very neighborly, of course, we, and we did hear that. Um, and she did have a temper. So, again, anything is possible. So, from 1656 to 1680, she spent about half her time in prison. And through that, over the years, through that, in that period of time, she was, um, she was whipped twice, uh, she was brought before the court on at least eight occasions. She was fined. Uh, she was admonished once. They probably slap on the hand, whatever. Um, put under bond twice. And I don't know the bond piece. That could be the $10 um, from Craddock. That could be they, they tried to collect. I don't know. But they don't mention him. They only mention her. Um, so she was set in stocks. She was searched for witch marks. She was tried for witchcraft twice and ultimately three times. Um, she was watched for diabolical imps. That was one of the things that they said that, so locked in leg irons, um, and she was in prison the one final time before her death, in which, at which time they um, tried to charge her with witchcraft again. So we, we mentioned that she's charged twice for witchcraft. The first time was in 15, six, 15, uh, 1656, um, and the trial was held in Boston. There were 26 witnesses who testified in the trial. So that must have been everybody in town. I mean, um, the main oh, evidence in the trial. Oh, she gossiped about. I know it. <laughs> Maybe. I'm more I'm thinking because I watch all these reality TV shows. I'm like, damn, <laughs> she would make an awesome reality TV like Real Housewives of New Hampshire. Yes, holiday edition. Like she would be a producer's dream. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. She probably would have. <laughs> so the main evidence in the trial um, was the witch marks that they found on her when they whipped her before she was brought in. Um, so they would have take removed her clothes to whip her. So she's you know she's not. Um, so that was what prompted them. They said she had witch marks on her body. So. Um, but the main evidence in the trial outside of that, she was, they said that she was and some of this information just doesn't make sense to me. It says that she was involved in the death of a child. Um, and there's some speculation as to whether the child was deformed, but it, they don't say who the child belonged to. They don't, there's none of that information. They don't say who accused her or why, why she, I don't know. Um, she was blamed for the death of a bedridden man, which again, I, um, she, they, and they said that she killed their cattle, the townspeople cattle through demonic agency. Um, they said that, uh, she brought sickness to people that she feuded with and she killed their animals. Um, and that she had knowledge of conversations that were private that nobody, nobody would know. So, um, those were, those were the charges that were brought, brought up in court and outside of the, the witch marks. Um, and that's why they charged her with witchcraft was, a, was the marks, not these other things. Well, the court did not convict her of witchcraft. They convict her, convicted her of, of a lesser charge of being of, they called it being, it's familiarity with the devil is what they called it. So she was kept in Boston prison um, until 1660 and they released her because her husband pleaded with the court to release her because he needed her at home. He needed her at home to work. So she spent four years in prison for the familiarity of a of, with the devil, not for witchcraft. 
and they let her go. So my thought is, is if she murdered a child and was responsible for the death of a bedridden man and was killing animals, why would they release her? So, um, but while she was in prison, her husband put her, put her name on the deed of their property, took his off, put hers on, um, so that he could ask the town people for help, basically take care of him and help him work his land without having to give the town anything. So if he didn't own the property, she did, he wouldn't be responsible to pay the town. They would just be, he would be a charity case. You know what I mean? So at that point, he would have been 86 years old. So he probably would have needed help. But um, obviously his mind was still there if he was shady enough to, 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 to you know, put his property in someone else's name so he wouldn't have to give, him, give the town people, townspeople anything. So um, she did petition the court and she was released and uh, went home to her husband. Although um, also during the time that, that she was in, in prison, once he had done this, um, Craddock, who was, who was the indentured uh, servant, uh, they were indentured to, excuse me, um, he was trying to collect the $10 bond from them, the 10, 000, the 10 pound bond from um, William. And uh, I think that was in 1657. And William pleaded with the court for relief. He didn't want to have to pay it, probably because of his age and he, whatever his reasons are. But um, the court demanded that the town take over his property because um, he owed this debt. So the town had to take over his property, take over his estate, and they had to support him. So whatever, whatever um, was, whatever work was done on the land, whatever was farmed, whatever monetary value came out of that, the town took and used to support him. And Eunice, because she was in jail, and they had to, you had to pay if you were in prison. You had to, your family had to pay for you to be in prison at that time. So. Um, there's a little confusion on that because um, there's another story that says that the town actually gave him his land back, but I, I, I don't know that that's true because I see more evidence for the, for the, to uh, explain the, the first, to back up the first explanation. Um, so, so Eunice comes home, he dies, William dies in 1662. And when he dies, it's discovered that he had, a, he had written a will which left his property to a neighbor. The neighbor's name was Thomas Webster. And he, he put him in his will because he was supposed to be taking care of him while he was sick or infirm or whatever the case was or taking care of his property. So anyway, that was his way of thanking him by giving him his property. So he left Eunice her clothes, and that was it. This Thomas Webster got all the property and tools and animals and, and whatever. So, um, but be, because of the, the 10 pound, the whole, the whole deal, Eunice, um, the town disputed, disputed this will because they didn't think that it was right. So um, because it invalidated Eunice's share of the property, so even though she, she did get in trouble, that was still half hers. So um, the court ordered the town to take the property and use it to pay for Eunice's care, prison, whatever, and William's care uh, had he survived. So that was done through the Norfolk County Court. They're the ones that stepped in. Um, and what, what they did was they, they took and they, um, they set aside the will. They paid all the debt, William's debts, and then they took half of what was left and gave that to uh, Thomas Webster, who he had willed the property to, and the other went to support Eunice. So the town kept that to support her. Um, so what, but she wasn't free long, and they blamed her again for calling neighbors despicable names. So um, I think in addition to, um, I think part of the reason she was put back in, in prison too was because she did not uh, maintain the terms of her release. And I think that was supposed to be that she left Hampton, which she didn't do. She stayed there. Um, so she ended up going back to prison. Um, and the third time she went back, 
they, the neighbors or townspeople, somebody observed her talking to the devil at her house. So they whipped her before they took her back to prison. So I don't, you, you never see evidence of any of this. It's all hearsay. So she spent the next 10 years in and out of prison. So when she was released at the age of 70, she was homeless. She didn't have a place to live. So when she returned home, the town put her in a little hut near the meeting house, which is where the meeting house ghost story comes into play. Um, so the town ordered the townspeople to take care of her. So everybody had to contribute. They had to bring her food and wood. And if they didn't, they would be fine. So there's a little animosity there with the townspeople having to be responsible for her. Um, in addition to that, the young people that lived in the town, they liked to antagonize her. They would play tricks on her and get and basically bait her. So, so now she's 70 at this point. Um, and um, they tried her for witchcraft again. So this time when they, they tried her, they're blaming her. They're saying that she um, made threats to the night watchmen. She, um, she was blamed for a puppy whining and barking in the meeting house, which I don't. Um, and now they're saying that she's taking various animal shapes. They blamed her for um, a neighbor's oven producing foul tasting bread. And then the, the, the piece that, caused her to be charged with witchcraft is that they said that she enticed a nine-year-old girl to, to live with her. And they don't, there's no history or information about what that was. Did they want, did she want her to live with her to take care of her? Did, was she trying to trap her or whatever? There's no, no indication of that story. So, um, so amazingly, even though she was prosecuted for this, um, and again, this is in 1673, um, um, again, she went to court and she wasn't convicted. They didn't find her guilty again. So the court, this is again, the court does not find her guilty of witchcraft. So she goes home. So here's the thing. So she goes home in 1673, her husband's dead and it's quiet until 1680. So for that period of time, seven years, she lives quietly with no incident. Her husband is dead. She lives quietly. And then in 1680, they accuse her of being a witch again. They, they, there's no documentation that says why. Um, and this time she was just held in a local prison. She never even got to Boston. They held her in leg irons. But again, the jury did not find her guilty. So she was sent home. And she died a month later in her bed in the little hut. So she she the townspeople didn't see her for a few days so i guess they might have thought that was odd which maybe it was so they actually broke into her hut to see and they found her dead um they the story is that they buried her right away in an unmarked grave and that they drove a stake through the ground with a horseshoe in it um attached to it to prevent her from rising from her earthly grave um, I, I think that some of that's probably folklore. Um, the unmarked grave piece, yes, because there is no grave. She wasn't buried with, next to her husband or anything. So that piece, true, I suppose. So the whole story um, comes to an end. In 1930, 1937, all these years later, there's a, a Goody Coal Society was, was formed. Goody Coal, Goody coming from... Um, the story from John Greenleaf uh, Whittier, who he, he was a poet, and he wrote a couple of poems. One was called The Wreck of, the Wreck of uh, Rivermouth and um, The Changeling, and those poems were about her, and that was how he referred to her in, in the poem. So in 1937, the Goody Cole Society was formed, and they did that to restore her citizenship that had been stripped away from her because of... Um, because of her being in jail and because of what they said. And in 1938, the residents voted to return her rightful citizenship. Um, and they did this dramatic presentation over the radio and, and made a big thing of it to uh, restore her citizenship. 
So um, that's really the story of the haunting of um, Meeting House Green Memorial Park. And it's just, um, I think it's, there, there are some things that I don't, that don't settle well with me. Um, of course, we talked about her marri being married. And obviously, she wasn't that young when she got married. So she must have been in her 40s when she married. What was the reason for that? Was it just because they were going to the new world together? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, my heart breaks for this woman. Yeah, I think she was a target pretty much. I, but. I kept hearing scapegoat, 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 which we know that if we're looking at this with our conspiracy hats on, we know that the controllers are often going to find scapegoats. And mm -hmm. I looked, I refreshed, I had to refresh my memory with the Salem. So this is like about 10 years by her death. Yeah. yeah. There was about 10 years 16, before yeah. Salem started. Yeah, 1692. And, and I know when I was researching Salem, there were all these laws when you wanted to, when you wanted to accuse someone of witchcraft, then Salem broke all these laws. You had to put money up yourself. And if the court found the person innocent, you would lose that. I mean, it was, it was just this right. hoops you had to jump through to try to ensure that there weren't false accusations because we can see in this time period you can just make up any rumor about anyone. And if enough people believe it, I mean, we see that today, even today, right? Like if enough people believe it, then that well, really, they'd already been, they've already, they'd already been primed even before coming to this country. They'd already been primed with that, with that mentality of, of which, 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 which. And if you do one thing that's not normal can, in your eyes, then they're a witch. So I think that because they're already, they already have that mindset that's the first thing that comes to their mind when they think of someone as being mean or not. Or an out, someone that's just, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure I've been accused of witchcraft multiple in multiple lives. I'm sure I've burned at the stakes in multiple lives. And it's funny you talk about the witch's markings. Y'all, that's anything from like a birthmark to a mole. Right. And so if they are, if they're dead set on like trying to prove you guilty, they could take any type of, mole or birthmark on your body and claim that that's a witch's mark and i think a lot of people you know and and bless her heart like i would get i would be probably a pretty mean nasty person too if my whole life i had people doing things to me behind my back like her husband like holy crap you know and it well, is yeah, and i mean you you, you figure he was supposed to pay the ten dollar ten pounds i keep saying dollars ten pounds you know, he, he was involved in the, the biting of the hand piece and nothing, he gets no reprimand, no, there's nothing, you know, and obviously he made her do all the work. She's a lot younger than he was. So in the property, it was, you know, he had her, they asked, he asked the court to release her so she could go home and work the property. So he didn't ask out of the kindness of his heart because he loved her and needed her. He asked because he needed somebody to go work the farm. So, um, so what is that all about? Um, so so I, just, I just put it into the converter, the historical conversion of currency, which who knows if this is even correct or not, but just to give us an idea. So I entered 1638, enter target year 2023, enter old value in pounds, 10 value of beginning of target year in dollars. So that would be, so for us, if we're looking at that in dollars and what that would be now, that's about $2,266. That's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. To pay for a, a voyage over from, you know, that's definitely way more expensive than an airline ticket we pay today, you know? Yeah. And so, and yeah, in this point, if we're looking at the historical information at this point too, a woman, a wife is not really, considered to be a full citizen anyway she's considered a property of her husband and so in any type of legal matters like this it would default to the husband anyway because the wife has no ability i mean i've said that about the southeast that the southeast here where i live you know say what you want about the southeast but this was the one of the first areas in our modern world to give women the right to inherit their father's estate so she's in a lose-lose situation as a woman anyway right yeah and if you stop and think about um, I mean, you think about the whole, his, if you think about William and his, throughout his life in, 
in their marriage, at least. I mean, he doesn't pay the, the debt. He, he, you know, he, he steals, he's manipulative. He obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, it's my opinion that, that he wasn't very motivated if he was a carpenter and he didn't do well. How can you not do well in the new world with building, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and then there's also the piece that their, their connection to John Wheelwright. So obviously he had issues. He was banished for sedition. He, um, he had, he is just, he was just, it was odd. So, and when you look at his relationship to, and I'm not saying that this is actually a thing, but, um, he knew Cromwell. They were, they were, they were schoolmates at, um, um, Cambridge. They went to school together. They were classmates. They were friends. Um, and from what I, from what I have seen, and again, I can't say this is true, but I know that there, there is a book that was written in the 1700s. Um, uh, it was written, it was a, an anonymous book. It was written in 1745, and um, it was written by um, Abby Loredan, I think is how you say it. it, was a French person. And that in that book, he says that, he, she, whoever says, um, that Cromwell was one who actually started Freemasonry. So, again, and there's, there's, there's weird stories around Cromwell's head, which again, I'll put that his skull has been passed around. So right. um, I will put those links down in the description box when I cover that. And it's, there's so many, and that's what I, I, you know, it's so funny, Tracy, because we know Cromwell took down the royal family in the UK yeah, for a bit. Charles, right. Yeah. And had, had, had them had beheaded and then it, they brought them back and, so, and I've, I've been talking about this idea of junk conspiracy, and so it's almost like you have to be very careful when you're navigating what the truth is, because the bad guys, we'll say for lack of a better word, since we're on YouTube, the bad guys are going to put people in place to look like good guys that are actually working for the bad guys, right? Right, right. We see that in the political system all the time. And that's that just to me is screams Oliver Cromwell. Because I know when I covered our, Oliver Cromwell, I was like, this douchebag. I was like, <laughs> yeah, he took, he sucked. Talk about sucking all the joy out of life. Like, right. it was so bad that the English people were like, can we have the kings back? <laughs> they were like, this is, you know, and mm -hmm. so, and yeah, and we see it's all, it's all, yeah, I mean, and here's this woman, and Go I know Goody, the name Goody is was a, a nickname. I wonder if it was a nickname for Eunice. Was that how that was her birth name? I, I think, yeah, it's 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 a name that was um it was actually created by um uh, the the poet Whittier. He, he the poems that he wrote, that's how he referred to him and the poems, uh the changeling uh Whittier, uh John Greenleaf Whittier. He, that's how he referred to her in his poems, the wreck of the river mouth. And, um, but yeah, so. Cause there were a few goodies in Salem as well that yeah. were accused. Um, yeah. and yeah, so with the hauntings, so. people just see her spirit in the meeting house and have experiences with her. Yeah. Yeah. So there's never been any, any foul play or anyone die or there's never been anything really negative. It's just that, she's there which i suppose that why wouldn't that be true she was buried in an unmarked grave you know and if there's a so. karmic you know that's the thing about this that was the one thing when i first went to india because i you know tracy's up in new england i'm down in the southeast both new england and the southeast if we're looking at the history books of what they tell us we're the original 13 colonies there's a lot of ghosts on the southeast or up and down the east coast new england and the southeast like both both i mean i grew up with ghost stories i mean when i first went to india and i lived in england for a while there were a lot of ghost stories I, that was one thing i noticed was i didn't feel the presence of a lot of ghosts so i know there are ghosts there but it's not as overwhelming as it is here in in the united states and i i always just kind of figured in my my own assumption that that was because in a hindu based religion they accept reincarnation so once death comes there's an easier release than maybe for us in a world in a world where we didn't 
we, we, we thought this was it. And so that made sense to me that karmically ghosts would kind of hang around because they want vindication. They can't release the story of, of, of their lives and they're hoping for some sort of vindication. And I also think there's a they're kind of trapped in this. As a Sam, this. Yes, a Sam Scar cycle. And it kind of like, I don't know. It just, it, it's, it's so freaking, when we go through trauma and I think, you know, looking at this story and all these other stories like this from the eyes of 2023, we understand more about how the human brain works too with like trauma. When somebody repeatedly goes through trauma, they do something called disassociation. And I can imagine that I know I've done it. I think probably everybody at some point has disassociated. So what that means in layman's term, basically, it's a little bit deeper than this, is that when you're in, it, it's kind of that freeze response, but you actually kind of leave the situation. Like your mind kind of leaves the situation in order to process through the situation that you're in, if that makes sense. And yeah, so you, dis yeah, you, you disassociate yourself so you can do what needs to be done. And you just set that piece of the emotional traumatic piece aside just to get through and that I think sometimes is where where it gets lost or buried and we have to address it later because you you set it aside because you need to focus on what you're doing and it gets buried. Yeah, yeah, it's um and so I can imagine with someone like Goody Cole, the you know, the her life was just abuse after abuse after abuse after abuse after abuse, and she had no one in her corner to help her. Right. I mean, talk about a soul contract. Holy shit. You know? Yeah. They did. She had no family uh, on this continent. She, she came here. Um, and yeah. who knows, maybe, maybe she was left alone in England and that was why she came this way because she didn't have any um, family. I don't, I don't know. I couldn't, I did right. try to find, but I, that we kind of decided to do this at the last, not last minute, but I didn't have a whole lot of time to. It's hard. If I had more time, I probably would have gone well, back for this. You know, I'm feeling like, I mean, I know that Sarah, that my tea leaf reader friend is a psychic medium as well. And so I'm wondering if maybe I could even contact her to see if there's something yeah. to be done to release Goody from yeah. her samskaric chain so it's almost like she's in and there's different kinds of hauntings there's like an imprint haunting which what's an imp a imprint haunting isn't necessarily an intelligent haunting it's like something so dramatic happened that the, the it's like taking a photograph of that moment so the spirit you're seeing isn't really there it's like a photograph like in savannah for example savannah georgia there's a story of um every anniversary of when the stock market crashed there's a guy that jumped out of a window and every year they see it the same thing so it's like a photograph of an imprint of this really traumatic event so the spirit's not there it's just the photograph but with an intelligent haunting the spirit is there and can communicate and there's something going on and it's either that she's so traumatized that she's still stuck in the cycle of goody coal and she can't release that mm -hmm. in order to move into the next incarnation or she's choosing to stay behind in order to find some sort of vindication and whether the two whichever two are correct they're both very 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 sad and and something that i think we do have the responsibility to do to, to free a soul so that they can go mm -hmm hopefully make the choice, the free will choice. She has to make that choice to move into the next, into the next round. But I can't, I mean, I can't imagine how it makes me emotional, like how yeah. hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, one of the things that, that surprises me um, about her, her second trial is that um, if you, if anybody that knows anything about law, you can't, I mean, granted, it's a, a second accusation, but you can't be tried for the same crime tri twice, but they took, they took evidence from the first, and the first crazy. trial to use to try to convict her the second time. So to me that, which maybe that's why the jury didn't convict her. I don't know, but um, that's so a, yeah, that's double jeopardy. You can't, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so there, so there's that too. I just, um, but I think the thing that that surprises me most about it is that whole that that seven year period of time where everything seemed to be quiet after he died. So what does that tell you? What does that t that Jesus. to be that? that He's a sicko. I Jesus. think so. And at this point, divorce wasn't readily available. She right. wasn't wealthy. You know, again, as a woman, you're at the mercy of even the wealthy. Yeah, no family. No family. 
no friends. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so easy for people, you know, so if they're trying to set her up as a scapegoat, of course they're going to go around and whisper in someone's ears about this woman. Maybe she was, maybe she was a fiercer woman. Maybe she was mm -hmm. a little bit more, maybe she fought back a little bit more than other more demure, submissive women did at that time. And maybe that was why some of the, um, some of the townsfolk was able were able to readily believe maybe rumors that were possibly started by her own husband. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know. And so this is this is just it's heartbreaking. And as a female, I mean, I cannot even imagine because at, at this point, as females, we have we have rights, right? Like we have. Mm -hmm. And I want to remind people, like we've been looking at the Protestant Reformation. Everybody's like, oh, the Protestants are amazing. They're not satanic. Only the Catholics are. Listen, if you go and read some of the things that these that Martin Luther, John Wesley, that all these people have said, especially about, I mean, the own, the person who started the Methodist church, which I always thought the Methodist was like the most relaxed. The person who started the Methodist church literally believed that women did not have souls and that once they were done with their birthing years should be taken out back and put down. So this is the, this is the culture that women are up against at this time period. Now we're coming into obviously towards the 1700s, we're getting into a little bit more, we're starting to see some shift happening, but this woman had nothing. And especially when she became a widow, and my, my research into to witches and the label of witches that most widows were labeled that because they were seen as hacks. They had no value left for society anymore. Their husband was dead. They couldn't bear children anymore. So they had no value to society. So that's how they kind of carry the label of witch at that time. Well, well, and also, too, in her case, her husband died. The town had to be responsible for her. So, of course, they're going to say, oh, she's a witch, take her away so we don't have to deal with her, which is what they did or what they tried to do, but the jury wouldn't convict, so they had to send her home. But So they did try to do that to her. Oh, we'll just get rid of her. So I don't, I don't know. I don't see, I know that anytime you, you look up you know, Goody Cole, it says the first witch of, she wasn't convicted of being a witch. So, um, so there is that. Um, yeah, she was convicted of a lower charge, but even that, I think, I don't know. I feel that maybe she was a scapegoat, like you said. Um, There's more to this story. I actually want to come up there and see the meeting house in yeah. New Hampshire. So, um, New Hampshire. Yeah. New Hampshire. Oh, and there's so many different, there are so many places to, to, to look at. So, um, up here that, Yeah. I mean, the, the Mount Washington Hotel has a room that's haunted. Um, yeah. There's I, mean, some you, you I mean, just putting myself in those shoes. I mean, I think about that down here in the southeast. It's different weather down here. But like, I think about, okay, you, you, the story they tell us, like you got on a boat, you left northern Europe or England, you're in this new world, you don't know anyone, the weather is different. You're having to, and, and up in New Hampshire, in that area, you've got very cold winters, very harsh winters yeah. that, that can kill you if you don't know how to survive. You know, down here in the South, there was malaria, yellow fever, all these other um, swamp-based sicknesses that people had to learn how to work with. Um, and you've got all of the, these, these, the, the nature is stacked against you. And then you don't have a friend in the town. You have no one that's taking your side and you're at the mercy of, you know, if, if her husband was alive today, we would probably label him a narcissist and a psychotic, a psycho, a, what they call it, a narcopath, a, a psychopath with narcissistic abuse. And, and so bless her heart. Like, I mean, I just mm -hmm. can't imagine. And so, I hope that anybody in that area, if you see your spirit, like, don't be afraid. Just talk to her. That's maybe what she's, I can't, maybe it's emotional. Maybe, maybe what she's, she's looking for a friend. So, and I think, too, that maybe when in 1937 and 38, when they restated her citizenship, part of me thinks maybe someone at that point um, was was maybe trying to do, do that to a certain degree, trying to um, maybe provide some healing in there for, I mean, the, the, obviously the people that did that to her are, are gone. I mean, you can't, there is no retribution because they're not, even her haunting isn't going to, you know, it's not going to affect the people that did her harm. So uh, sometimes I, I guess I think that maybe in 1938, 
they were trying to heal that wound, restate, you know, restate her citizenship and tell her that we believe her. We, we, right, we, we see right. the truth at this point. We see the truth for what it is. I'm wondering now, I'm starting to think, is she hanging around? So she sees the fall of the controllers because we know the controllers know how to reincarnate. They know how to jump into other bodies. So part of me is like, that's my conspiracy hat again. Is she hanging around yeah. just to see their fall just to be like, basically give you the middle middle finger because in my opinion the real witches and warlocks were the ones doing this to the to the people right doing this to the people in salem doing this to the people all over europe those were the real witches and mm -hmm. warlocks not people like goody cole or though all the people that lost their lives in salem or all the people who lost i mean we know from my study of king james who was like one of the most horrific human beings that ever lived and you know the one that basically corrupted the bible um he was so deviant there was a case in scott i think it was scotland where somebody a woman was accused of witchcraft and she was found innocent and he went back and over because he was the king and he said no 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 she's guilty and he watched her be tortured to death because he enjoyed that he loved seeing that pain and to, to I just can't imagine whipping a grown. I can't. I mean, listen. Any any man who raises his hand to a woman is disgusting to me anyway, and and is is not a man in my opinion. But to actually whip a woman, to whip a woman, like I just I don't know. And and then you're right. Like if she literally was participating in the death of a child or of another human being, why would they release her from jail? These are all, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't. They must not have had evidence because they didn't even convict her. They didn't even convict her of that. They didn't convict her of killing a child or a, a bedridden man. They convicted her of being familiar with the devil. So we're all familiar with the devil. It doesn't mean we agree with them, right? We, we we all we all know his. It's like that the uh, Rolling yeah. Stone song "Symphony for the Devil." <laughs> like, yeah. pleased to meet yeah. you. Right. So. <laughs> Um, so anyway, yeah. So did they put her in jail for four years for her own protection? I don't know. But and I how mean, long would she have been there if he didn't plead with them to let her free so she could go back and work? She was probably like, don't let me. She's like, no, leave me here, back. please. I don't want to go back. I like this way better. That's a way worse jail. And how yeah. much it's crazy that he he has somebody who also was kind of scandalous and was it obviously he's the mastermind for in our opinion that the fact that the, the court would sway with him and his opinion i mean it just it just yeah it's, it's awful so yeah. thank you so much tracy for presenting this story i'm gonna see if i can reach out to sarah and maybe we can do yeah. a part two and see if we can and if she could channel That'd um be good. She did a channeling session with me and she does pick up on. And so, um, cause I feel so bad for, I mean, this is a human being, even though, you know, they say that what, what's that I'm paraphrasing the quote about history. It's history is like a foreign country. They do things differently there, even yeah. though the life was different in the historical periods that we're talking about now it's a different culture. None of us would probably survive it. If we got thrown back in that time, we'd all be hanging. Listen, Listen, if, if, if all of us just got thrown back into that time period, we all be hanging well for witchcraft because they would be like, what the hell are you, you know? So, but, but beyond that, we are all human beings. And, and regardless of what time period we're talking about, we all understand pain and we all understand betrayal and betrayal trauma and sabotage and all that kind of stuff. And so I, it, it's heartbreaking to hear these stories that these, mm -hmm. these people went through. And so, so let us know, you guys, down in the the uh, comment section below. If you're if you're from New Hampshire, like Tracy, <laughs> let us know if you uh, if you you, re you recognize the story and your thoughts and your opinions. What what did you hear? I mean, I'm assuming growing up in that area, you heard the story kind of being told. The well, legends. I, yeah, I actually I was born here, but I didn't grow up here, so. Um, I came back here later in life. I actually grew up in Alaska. So, and I did do the, the roughing it thing. So um, that's right. It's not fun, but hey, you do what you do. You do what you do. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I didn't, I didn't hear a lot of, you know, while I was growing up that, that type of thing. But later as I came back, I, you do hear these stories and, you know, they do, they, sometimes they do little, well, I say this, I don't know for sure because I haven't watched the TV and, 
probably 20 years. Um, but I, I do remember years ago that they would do little little local programs on things that happen. On the, at the end of the news, they would do, you know, this is going on. Or do you remember this? So. Well, listen, if Goody Cole, if your spirit is listening right now, honey, you are way more famous than those who persecuted you now. And you, you mm-hmm. have, I think a lot of people understand what happened. So, but I would love to hear from our viewers. Like, what do you know about this story? What did you, what were you told growing up? I mean, there's countless stories down here in, in the Southeast that we just mm-hmm. kind of hear growing up. And um, have you experienced, if anybody is listening, have you experienced the ghost of Goody Cole? Did you ever see her? Let us know your experience. And, and- I think too, I'm sorry. I think too, there's a, it's, it's a little misleading because the plaque that's on the ground by the rock that uh, they have uh, displayed <clears throat> in the park, it says that she was convicted of witchcraft. She wasn't, she was not. So there's a little bit of a, I think that's just a way to get people, draw people. in. I think so. Um, more but people she are using her. She's getting more and more and more people yeah. are using her. Yeah. Yeah. So, but anyway, so that, that was just the final little, Thing that I wanted to add is that she really wasn't convicted of witchcraft. So, well, bless her heart. She deserves mm-hmm. to have a good life next life. So, uh, her her soul picked a crazy existence for it to know itself. So, yes, she did. <laughs> So hats off to her, mad respect. But um, but I know Tracy, I want you to come back and present some more findings. Will you yeah, be sure. willing to do that? And you guys make yes. sure again you go and you subscribe to Tracy because we want to get as many people who are looking seekers. I, I hate calling us truthers, seekers mm-hmm. out there to to try to figure out and rewrite some of these wrongs that have mm-hmm. been put upon us as 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 a people. And the Goody Cole story isn't just about the Americans. It's, you know, mm-hmm. this is a human story. This this reaches all the corners of the earth because this is a human story and we can all relate to that feeling of fear, loneliness, betrayal, abandonment. Uh fortunately for me through my trials and tribulations in my life, I've always had so many people behind me and on my side and hearing me, but to be that alone, God, I can't even imagine. I can't, I'm, I'm proud of her for not ending her own life. Let's just put it that way. That took courage and strength. And so, so thank you for presenting this, Tracy. Sure, no problem. I actually had fun doing that. It not- is fun. It's, it's so yeah. fun, isn't it? <laughs> I like to do all that. Oh, 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 wait, I found this. Now let's go over here. Yeah. It's so fun. I get I, lost in it. It's me yeah. too. And and that is why I'm so grateful for SEO, which Tracy is now doing as well, because that is what is affording me the ability to go back and start doing more research into other stories because mm-hmm. it, it takes a lot of time, but it's so fun. It's such it's it's just a fun thing to like snoop around and see what you can find about your own history and humanity's mm-hmm. history and the story of us as people. Goody goody Cole's story is our story. It is the story of it's part of humanity's story. Her her life mattered. Her story, her pain matters. You know, it's that emotional center, as the law of one says, it's the emotional center, us being able to connect and have that empathy that helps us recognize our own soul. And so her story matters, you know, even to us in 2023. And so I hope that even in her death that she understands her life was not lived in vain. It matters. So, all right, you guys. Well, I hope you're having a happy, happy Monday as this is Mystery Monday. Um, I obviously today am on with Aquarius Rising Africa. I will be on with Aquarius, our solutions with Aquarius Rising Africa Tuesday, tomorrow for the CFO code because Wednesday I will be traveling. I have a few videos scheduled to drop while I'm away, but I should, once I get back from traveling, we'll have even more videos up. And of course, I can't wait to have Tracy come back on, um, mm-hmm. back on the show and do even more stuff. And I'm going to put the links to all the other videos that Tracy's done on this show as well before if you guys are just now tuning in to Esoteric Atlanta you can look and find all of Tracy's other work on Esoteric Atlanta as well again make sure you guys go and subscribe to her channel uh the more it's I think I'm I think I can say this with Tracy like I don't care I really don't care how many numbers subscribe subscribers I I have or anyone has but it does help put our work out there the more you subscribe i know i'm heavily shadow banned so if you're watching this please make sure you share it because that helps kind of break through the algorithms and get the work out there you guys so thank you so much everybody have a wonderful wonderful rest of your week if i 
don't see you guys before on a live show or anything. Happy Easter, or happy Ishtar. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so be celebrating this a little bit differently this year. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, all right, you guys, we love you all and we'll talk to you soon. Bye everybody.